I'm going to spend about the next eight minutes or so giving a summary of our annual report and uh, what I think the key achievements have been for the last year. And this also will provide the context for the strategy workshop that we're going to be doing um, later on. So as with last year, I thought I'd start by uh, reflecting on our operational journey since we started. And I'm going to do this in numbers. So in January 2020, we began with two part-time staff working three days per week, and that accounted for about 1.2 full-time workers. By next month, with the recruitment of our new assistant legal officer and additional hours for existing staff, we'll be up to five full-time equivalents and a staff team of six. So that includes myself as chief officer, Ben, our solicitor, who's on holds today, Prislava, who's with us today, and, he's, and she's one of our participants, so it's lovely to see her. She's going to be starting October the 11th as our new assistant legal officer for three days a week. Cornell, who's our rights officer, who started in January with us. And Benji, our policy and advocacy officer, who started in June, taking over from Amelia. And of course, we've got Emma as our finance and admin officer, who's uh, always working behind the scenes, doing something very important. In terms of our income, we started our first year with £67,500. And then in our second year from 2020 to 21, we secured £101,400 for our work. And last year, the period of the accounts, we secured, as Julie's already said, £168,246 of grant income and donations. And so for this year, um, which is from the 1st of April 2022 until March 23, We've, we have secured £178,906 of grant income and donations. And I'm really delighted and relieved to say that that's us for this year. And we are secure. And as Lloyd and Julie have said, we're able to have our reserves. So that's really brilliant. But we still have to work now for our grant for... 24 beginning January 24 because some of our rolling three-year grants come to an end so that includes our big one Esme Fairburn Foundation and then following on from that the Bering Foundation and also our Quality and Human Rights Grant but what it does mean as well and as Julie suggested um, that we're in a strong position now to review our salary structure and pay awards we do this annually and in a good position to respond to as Julie says the cost of greed crisis so we are still working on applying for grants and we also now have our online donations platform as well. And the final number to give you is that as of September, we now have 100 members and over 600 subscribers to our mailing list. And um, I think this is the right place to say thank you to our first members, our trustees, and also to our associates who are here. And, um, you know, we can't say enough at how much you guide us through the different working groups and the one-to-one -one support. Um, I really do think we have a super team. I think now we're at the right size and we have the right talent. And with your support, I think we are confident that we can make a difference to strengthen environmental democracy and protect the environment. So, to remind us, our vision is of a Scotland where every person's right to a healthy environment is respected, protected and fulfilled. We are the only organisation in Scotland that provides free legal expertise and public interest environmental law. And our mission is to assist everyone, especially people who face the biggest barriers to exercise their rights in environmental law and to protect the environment. And we're going to do this in four ways. Awareness raising of legal rights and remedies and supporting participation in environmental decision making. Advice, assistance and representation to increase access to justice and to hold public authorities and polluters to account. Advocacy in policy and law reform to improve the law. And strategic public interest litigation to tackle systemic environmental problems when we've done everything else. And we understand environmental law to include law relating to land use planning, climate change, pollution control, environmental health, the conservation of biodiversity and any other field which includes cultural heritage, transport, energy, to the extent that it impacts on the natural environment in Scotland. 
Now, some of you will have noticed that we've already tweaked this mission and vision statement, and that's been part of our strategic review process. I hope you approve. So what have we done with all the money and support so far? Well, I hope you agree that we've established the RCS as a financially resilient organisation with good governance, clarity of, person, clarity of purpose and vision. None of this would have, would have been possible without establishing strong relationships within networks of the environmental, legal and human rights organisations. And of course, building relationships with communities and academics to support our work. We've established open communication Scottish Government civil service teams to pursue our advocacy objectives. And our online briefings, guides and information have already been downloaded over 450 times. That's unique downloads. In June last year, we had our formal launch with our special guest, Professor David Boyd, who's the UN Special, special Rapporteur on Human Rights and the Environment, and also joined by the members of the Children's Parliament. And also in the same month, we launched our free legal advice service, and we now have had over 100 clients in the first year. In September, we were the only environmental NGO to be invited to the Human Rights Bill Advisory Board, and we're working really proactively with Jules as well, one of our trustees, to really hold uh, the civil service team to account and uh, influence and negotiate both the consultation and the implementation. In December, we saw the launch of the Advocacy Manifesto with our online petition for enforceable human right to a healthy environment. And we now have over 1,260 individual signatures and 58 organizations signed up. And we'll be doing another push on this early next year to coincide with the work that we're going to be doing on uh, advocacy for an environmental court um, with a consultation happening towards the end of May, June, the latest next year. In the beginning of this year, 2022, with the funding from the Equality and Human Rights Fund, we were able to have Cornell join the team as our rights officer to outreach to equality groups and areas of highest disadvantage. And this summer, as Lloyd's already alluded to, I think we can claim a small victory with the exemption of court fees for our cases introduced from the 1st of July. And I think that's just testimony to everybody in the room who's worked for this for so many years, and also I hope the work that we were able to do to push that over the line. We also meet regularly with the newly established Environmental Standards Scotland, and we submitted our first representation, i.e. complaint, on the barriers to access to justice in August. And in August as well, we uh, worked with Planning Democracy, supported by Friends of the Earth Scotland and RSPB, to submit a communication to the Aarhus Convention and Compliance Committee on Equal Rights of Appeal in the Planning System. And we consider that our first piece of strategic litigation. So that's what we've done. Where are we going? Well, last year we reviewed and updated our first business plan, and that takes us to the end of this year, December. And we're now in the process of developing a new three-year strategic plan from January 2023 with the updated vision and mission statement that, that I've already shown you. And we've also agreed that our four work programmes um, need to achieve the following outcomes. Our resources and outreach have increased awareness of environmental rights and how to exercise them. Our advice has enabled action on holding public authorities and polluters to account. Our advocacy has secured concrete progress on environmental rights in Scotland and reduced barriers to access to justice. And our strategic public interest litigation has improved accountability and enforcement of environmental law. Now our work programmes take a human rights based approach by promoting what we call the five panel principles, and that is participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment and legality. And we have a strong monitoring and evaluation frame, framework, which we're constantly evolving and improving, which has key quantitative and qualitative um, outputs that we report quarterly to the Board of Trustees and via our e bulletin subscribers. But how exactly will we achieve our outcomes, I hear you say? Well, we've done some work to identify our priorities and areas of action. And this is what we'd like to discuss with you at the workshop following the AGM. In particular, we want to help, we want you to help us do our SWOC analysis, our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, challenges. So we're asking you specific questions. What do you think we've done well so far? 
What are the opportunities we should focus on in the next three years? What are the challenges we need to tackle? And how will we know we've achieved our priorities? So I'll leave it there for now and ask if there are any questions or comments and perhaps focus more on the operations side because we'll be talking about the work programs in the workshop. <laughs>